secret. Yeah, sound, sound okay? Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the ICTS string seminar. So today we have Edward Masang. Uh, who will be talking to us about deriving the simplest gauge string duality. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you for the students who are uh, enduring a double feature today. <laughs> so uh, today I want to tell you a bit about some of the work I've been doing with Professor Gova Kumar here. Um, so in many ways, this is uh, work happening on your own turf, and I guess many students here are involved in this kind of program as well. Um, so this is something that's kind of uh, evolved into a much larger project, uh, now spanning almost, I guess, three papers. Um, so this first one came out in uh, December. The second one, you know, famous last words, but hopefully very soon. Um, and uh, uh, the third one, well, we'll see when that happens. So, uh, and of course, you know, out of all of those three papers as an hour, I won't be able to tell you everything that's going on. Um, and what I'll try to do is to just convince you of one thing. So it's to take a sort of snippet of this general uh, program and to convince you of the following fact, so that uh, we can look at sort of a, a very simple zero plus zero dimensional integral. Okay, so a theory of n squared iid random variables and show you that somehow secretly in there is hiding a string theory, okay? That somehow the moments of this theory can be rewritten as correlation functions in some string theory. And uh, the uh, sort of physical tool that we'll be using is what's called open closed open triality. And of course, I'll tell you what that is. Um, and, uh, so let, let me maybe just first kind of anchor this discussion. And I'll start with this kind of picture, which is now, I guess, 50 years old. So this is from the original Tuft uh, paper from 1973, in which the Tuft expansion became the Tuft expansion. Um, and sort of Tuft had this vision that these large end gauge theories were already somehow secretly string theories. And sort of the proposal was that if you looked at the Feynman diagrams of these theories, they somehow, you were thinking of them as skeletons of some 2D surfaces above, okay? And, you know, this really predates our modern understandings of holography and ADS-CFT. And we want to really sort of go back to this picture today and try to take this very literally, okay? So the sort of what we want to do is to kind of focus on this idea of holography and reframe it really, the perspective we want to take is that of open closed string duality, okay? So as I was saying earlier, um, you know, it's often sort of fruitful to think of holography kind of in terms of this pyramid and perhaps a lot of the talks that you might have heard recently kind of focus on this bottom one. So this box over here would be say the CFT. Um, it's a theory of matrices. Okay, so, uh, you know, this could be your favorite uh, toy models of n equals four super yang nils. Um, and when I say open string descriptions, I'm really saying that because the sort of ij indices of the matrix are really sort of the chan paton factors of some of some open string. They're labeling which of the brains this open string is ending on, okay? So often I'll kind of go, I'll use this language interchangeably of sort of open string and that of matrices. And uh, we want to look at really kind of the simplest, simplest example of that, okay? So, uh, which is in zero plus zero dimensions. So this is just an integral over these n squared variables. What the theory is, it's just the choice of this potential. And sort of the observables of that theory are going to be these single traces. So these are gauge invariant, they're UN invariant, as we talked about earlier. And sort of uh, you, you, you just um, take a product of these single traces, you do this integral that spits out some number, and that's the expectation value of these observables. Okay. So what I want to understand is what is this theory doing uh, sort of in this, in this whole pyramid? Okay. So can we understand what these numbers that they're computing from some closed string picture? So where does the closed string picture come in? So often we actually talk about the ADS part, okay? Often this is some description of say general relativity, some QFT fields on some ADS background. And a lot of sort of deciphering the hologram has been going kind of between these two boxes, okay? But the box that we wanna focus on is sort of uh, uh, the world sheet picture of strings, okay? So these are a closed string, surf um, so these are closed 2D surfaces, possibly with some marked points where you would sort of insert vertex operators on the string theory side. So in this example of n equals four, this would be say 2B string theory on ADS5 cross S5. And this picture of Tuft, what it's really uh, trying to think about is to think about the connection between these two boxes, going between the open strings, this theory of matrices, and looking at the Feynman diagrams of this matrix theory and trying to rethink of them as sort of a sum over Riemann surfaces with these marked points. 
So the name of the game today is to kind of take this toothed picture and see how far we can sort of push it and take it very literally. Okay, so um, let me maybe say also a couple of things just because matrix models and strings is a very old subject. Um, so uh, let me try to highlight a little what's new here. Okay, so uh, in people's kind of first pass at the subject, if you want, uh, we had to have a proposal as to sort of how we translate between the Feynman diagrams of this theory. So what I'm showing here is a snippet of some sort of giant Feynman diagram. So as you see here, there are cubic vertices. And the idea is that I look at the dual graph to that. Okay, so now this is much better than my board drawings. Okay, so the dual graph will here be a bunch of triangles. And I think of these triangles as sort of discreetly tiling this 2D surface. Okay, it's some tessellation of the surface. And sort of the idea was that what I need to do is I need to take some limit where the size of these tiles goes to zero to really get a sort of smooth world sheet. So a, a string theory would only emerge in this particular continuum limit. And that continuum limit is what's on the matrix model side called the double scaling limit, okay? So we need to sort of send this lattice size to zero and take that limit. But this is not the limit that we study in ADS-CFT, okay? So this is not the standard Tooft expansion that we were talking about on the first slide. So you might ask, okay, what is it that we're possibly missing as to sort of how holography works in these kind of bigger setups? And is there maybe something that we can learn in this simple setup that will tell us about more generally how kind of open closed string duality works? Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna really study these, system, these systems in the standard Tooft limit, not in the double scaling limit. We're certainly not the first people to have thought about these things. Um, so probably the first as far as I can think of are probably uh, Dijkraaf and Waffa. Uh, in the context of string theory. So they were looking at matrix models in particular type of string theories called topological strings. But the perspective was again, a little different. So what they were showing is that these matrix integrals, you could sort of derive them by um, starting out all the way from some open string field theory on brains, okay? And it sort of reduces all the way down via some steps, this holomorphic Chern Simons is some intermediate step down to this matrix integral. But this again, this is a very sort of open string picture. The closed string picture they proposed was to look was to think of a closed particular type of topological string, this B model string, and it was moving in a space which was the spectral curve of this matrix model, which we talked about in the pre-seminar. Okay, so that algebraic equation we talked about, that would be defining the geometry of the sort of closed, the emergent geometry of that space. But this is a bit hard to check because we don't really have a sort of world sheet description of what this proposal really means. And there's nothing like observables that we can check. So what we'd like to have is to tell the, you know, I can compute endpoint functions on one side, compute endpoint functions on the other side, and really check that they agree. And in that sense, I could really tell you that I understand what the closed string dual is. <laughs> um, you should ask them. And then, uh, so, um, so, so there, there are various uh, discussions. I mean, um, so one way you could talk about a, particular type of um, sigma model in a Calabiao that uh, whose geometry is sort of determined by the spectral curve. That would be one way to sort of rigorously say it. And I think that's also probably what they would say. Um, they looked at some things called these preformations. Yeah. More like partition functions. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Correlation functions. So yeah. More like partition. So those are the type of things that you can match. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, so what we're going to try to do today is to remedy these things, which is to both look at this tooth limit and to really try to imagine that we can derive some sort of world sheet theory and in particular tell you how to translate between these single traces that we talked about on the matrix side and particular operators in the closed string side. That's really what we want to do. Okay, so before I lose everyone in the talk, let me try to maybe summarize kind of the three lessons that we've kind of come out, uh, have probably emerged from this program a program that goes back already to, I guess, uh, uh, some of the work of Konzevich and then of uh, Rajesh already in the early 2000s. So the first thing is, well, if it's not some sort of discretization of the world sheet, okay? So we, I need to give you sort of a new recipe to translate between Feynman diagrams, some over Feynman diagrams and sums over 2D surfaces. And the thing that we're gonna do that's gonna replace this idea of a latticization of the world sheet is what's called the Strabel parametrization Okay, so this is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G with N marked points, okay? And these are just N positive numbers. And so this question as to sort of how the large N gauge theories are reorganizing themselves into string theories is sort of as follows, is that we're gonna think of each single Feynman diagram, okay? 
as some sort of string world sheet. This is a fairly strong statement, okay? You might have thought that maybe just somehow the sum of Feynman diagrams is equal to the sum of the world sheets, but that there wasn't really a one-to-one -one map, okay? This is a statement at the level of the sum end, okay? It's to really, the slogan you should take away from today is really each Feynman diagram as a string world sheet. So what is this tool? Okay, so this is some uh, mathematical tool that was sort of, uh, sort of uh, shown by Strabel and kind of used famously by Konzevich in his proof of the Witten conjecture. Um, for those for whom that's helpful, okay. Um, so let me just tell you a bit of a bird's eye view of how that works. Obviously, you know, that could be two lectures on its own. So I'll just try to give you a flavor of the way it works. So if I have some genus G surface over here, I'm also gonna have some genus G graph. First things first, okay. If I have N punctures or N marked points, those would be where I would insert, you know, imagine I'm computing some genus zero five point function. I think someone's doing that here, in fact, uh, with the show, right? Okay, so this, this is your scary picture. Um, so I would have a genus zero uh, world sheet, uh, sorry, um, graph over here. And there would be as many faces as there are punctures. So this, as you can see, there are five faces that I've labeled one through five, okay? And if you want, the way I'm going to parameterize the moduli of this of this uh, of this surface is going to be by assigning numbers to each edge on this graph. Okay, and if you want the they're what I'll call lengths. So the lengths of these graphs they sort of function as variables as coordinates on this space. Okay, so later what we'll see is that we're going to be looking at very particular graphs where all the edges are assigned integer lengths. So those are gonna be very special points on the moduli space with integer coordinates, if you want, okay? Yes. Yes, so. Um, they don't scale with N. They don't scale with N, if that's your. Yes, so the, the dictionary will all hear between single, ver single trace operators and vertex operators on the string. That's great. Okay, so first things first. So this is kind of the, uh, what we're gonna do to replace this idea of discretizing the surface and this map between the Feynman diagrams and the 2D surface. Okay, so next thing. Well, we talked about deriving some sort of uh, gauge string duality, some open closed duality. So what does that even mean? Um, so I'll of course give you a sort of standard of proof that I can also live up to. So maybe one way of saying it is that we're gonna look at correlation functions of traces. So those are the observables in the matrix theory. And I want to rewrite them as a sum over 2D surfaces or more precisely as an integral over all the inequivalent 2D surfaces, an integral over this moduli space, MGM, okay? And so it's gonna tell you, we're gonna in fact have a open closed operator dictionary. So what that means is every time you insert some trace M to the K into this uh, matrix integral, that's the same as adding this OK, this is some cohomology class on, it's some form on this, on this space that you wanna integrate over, okay? So you tell me I want to insert trace m to the k, so no matter what else is in the correlator, and that means you uh, insert sort of this integrand on moduli space. Okay. Now, here what we've done is we've sort of rewritten this as a sum over 2D surfaces, and usually in physics when we think of writing something as a sum over configurations, we think of the weight that we assign to each configuration as coming from e to the s, well, where s is some action. So can I somehow think about the weight that I'm assigning to these inequivalent 2D surfaces here as arising from some sort of Lagrangian? Can I just write down something like uh, sort of a vanilla type Lagrangian that would tell you what is the string theory that I'm actually computing, uh, looking at? And so that is also something we can answer positively. So uh, we'll be looking at particular matrix models, sometimes also two matrices, although we have some of the two matrix experts in the room here. Um, and these will be the closed strings that we're after, okay? This is sort of the emergent closed string dual to the gauge theory. And in fact, it'll have two descriptions. So you might be a little surprised that there are two. Um, you might've thought, okay, N equals four, there's two B on ADS5 cross S5, why are there now two strings? This is a peculiarity of the fact that we looked at sort of the simplest gauge theories, these random matrix integrals. So we also get in many ways the sort of most tractable simplest string theories, which are topological strings. And there's a very special type of symmetry there called mirror symmetry. So if you want, this is the same closed string dual just described in different languages. So the two languages is uh, what's called the A and the B model, okay? So um, this B model, so to tell you which closed string theory, it turns out I just need to tell you one thing, which is sort of what the potential, the super potential is on the world sheet. And we're gonna tell you that 
give, if you start from some matrix model, there's a clear recipe to tell me what is that string that emerges. And it goes via this matrix model spectral curve. Okay, so from the spectral curve, I'll be able to sort of tease out what the super potential is. Was that a question? Okay. And on the A model side, okay, so the A model, this is again, uh, nothing too crazy. This is some West Amino with model with this gauge group as, so this is the target space of the string. Sometimes you might've heard this as the cigar geometry, okay? And uh, it's at a very particular level. So this is the level of the WCW. Um, it's twisted. That means that you've sort of turned it into some topological theory and sort of which matrix model you start out with uh, turns on to condensing certain operators, giving some expectation value to certain operators. So that's gonna be the map there between which matrix model and which string theory. So maybe any questions here, first of all? Yes, yes. Well, what, what's the third in, in your language? The matrix model. Yeah. Yes, yes, so those are, yeah. So in fact, okay, let me get to that. So these were all maybe kind of big picture statements. So let me tell you a bit about uh, kind of what I want to really do today. So uh, I want to give you something very concrete to sort of sink your teeth into, okay? And that'll be three boxes, those three things that are all going to be equal. And it's going to be about the equality of observables and all of these three things, okay? So it's going to be an equality between these sort of uh, uh, correlators of traces, so equality of matrix correlators, and then vertex operators in the string theory. Okay? And uh, once we do that, we're going to verify this proposal. So um, by looking at some simple identity that actually just reduces down to the equivalence of two matrix integrals, okay? And this will be our first pass at this idea of open, closed, open triality, first in a sort of very pedestrian version, if you want. Um, there's maybe two slightly messy slides here. Uh, just hold with me, but it'll allow us over just those two slides to be able to verify this entire proposal. So I think for that, maybe it's worth it. And then we'll kind of step back and look at a lot of pretty pictures. Um, and we'll think a bit about what are the manipulations that we were doing, and sort of what were kind of the broader meanings of those manipulations. And hopefully also something that we can step away from matrix models and think more generally about holography. So I think there's some really interesting things here to say. Um, well, uh, we'll see there when we get there. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll start with this proposal, we'll verify it. But, you know, the physicists kind of want to understand not just that it's true, but also sort of why is it true? Okay, so that's going to be this third part of the talk. We'll sort of ask the question, okay, well, why is it that those closed string theories are the ones that we had to land on? Okay, was there some sort of gut satisfying reason that those kind of had to appear? And I'll try to kind of frame the discussion. So both in this A model and this B model language around three things. So we'll see that uh, they're starting with these Feynman diagrams, we'll see that actually very particular uh, string configurations are important. So sort of the entire contribution to the path integral comes from very particular types of strings. And that's what these particular lattice points on this moduli space are. And then we'll ask, what are the maps from the world sheet to the target space that sort of this matrix model is encoding? And we'll see that it's something called belly maps. And then we'll take a sort of simplifying limit, which is something like the BMN limit in ADS-CFT and connect to sort of all these older results that we have over the last 30 years of these double scaled matrix models. And then we'll sort of do the same thing all over again in this B model language, and sort of they're kind of the main star of the game will be this uh, idea of topological recursion. Okay, so this is a kind of a very classic tool in random matrix theory. Um, and then we'll sort of recast, we'll, we'll see that it's kind of these mathematical tools can really be recast in the language of some topological matter theory coupled to the world sheet, the 2D gravity on the world sheet. And then again, we'll sort of go to this limit and that simplifying limit to recover a lot of the known expressions and sort of again, kind of connect to what we already knew. Okay, just as a good sanity check. Okay, so let's start with this proposal. All three things equal here, as you were asking. Okay, so uh, this is a very concrete uh, duality. Um, so we'll start with the Gaussian matrix model, but I just wanna emphasize that this is not just true just for free theories. Okay, it also works for interacting theories, so with some potential. Um, and this is an equality of correlators sort of to all orders in one over N, okay? This is not just some semi-classical statement. This is a sort of full quantum duality, if you want. Um, alternatively, I'll sometimes say an all genus uh, equality because sort of the, the genus, the one over N expansion on the matrix side is sort of the genus expansion on the string theory side, as we know. So um, what is this? So this is again, just kind of the, uh, 
this uh, product of traces. Okay, so the, these are the type of operators we want to look at. Um, we can compute these via some Feynman diagrams, and all the genus G Feynman diagrams would contribute to this number. Okay, this is just some number. And the idea is that these number is equal to that number and equals to that number. Okay, so what are those over here? These are correlation functions in this A model string theory. Okay, again, this sort of special type of WZW model. And because I told you which matrix model, I also need to tell you what operators I turned on in this theory. Okay, so it turns out I need to turn on some momentum plus two operator. So these Ks here are essentially labels for momentum. And it's telling you that any time I put in a trace M to the K, I'm inserting this vertex operator VK on this left-hand side. And so we do the same thing over here. So I told you it's the Gaussian matrix model. So I need to tell you what this potential is. So the super potential that's defining this B model is given as follows. And we'll see later how we get that from the spectral curve. And again, same thing. Every time I insert some trace M to the K, there's basically some operator here on this B model side that I insert that I've called curly, uh, curly TK over here. Okay. Please. Yes. Right. Good. So, yeah, 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 great. So, what's going to happen is on this side over here, we're going to slightly deform the super potential as well. Okay. So, there will be higher order terms in Z that will appear. In fact, it'll generically be non, it'll be some infinite series. Um, and over here, it'll turn on some other operator. And I can tell you also exactly what operator that you're giving some expectation value to. Okay. So it's like E to some operator in the equipment. Yes, 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 exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah, uh, th this is really just for simplicity. But uh, as I was saying, so if you in these interacting theories, there's a very clear recipe to how you further deform the background, which is a different potential and a sort of a turning on different momentum backgrounds here as well. And you can match the coefficients and everything. Okay, great. So let's verify that equality. Okay, so before we get into. Yeah. Good. So the I guess the technical assumption is any matrix integral in the one cut regime. So that's where all the eigenvalues basically fall just in some connected interval. Um, uh, right now, this is for one matrix. Yeah. Um, but I think we sort of understand. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. What well, were there maybe other types? Yeah, yeah, that, that's some technical assumption to understand a little about this operator dictionary. But. Yeah, but, but I, sort of generically for some polynomial potential, I don't know, I'd turn on some quartic or something like that. There's a sort of very clear recipe is how you, how you do this. So it's not just the free theory. Yeah. Multi cuts come if your potential has multiple, lots of minimum. Uh, extreme. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and so yeah. Uh, so even there, we can consider a case where all the eigenvalues are filled up here, but that's kind of a certain choice of saddle points. And then there are other saddle points where the cuts might be distributed differently. So those would be, if you wish, new exactly. saddles to expand around. Yeah. Uh, so if you this is an expansion around the single saddle. Yeah. And since you say saddle, this is the what's in the vehicle in the city in the larger vehicle. No, 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 no. So so maybe that's the slightly no no. So so this is this is to all orders in one over n. Um so to all orders in one over n about a given saddle. About a given saddle, exactly. There's a non-perturbative connection. Yes, if you have multiple saddles. So, so for example, you can have uh, what's called eigenvalue tunneling. So it would be, you have most of the eigenvalues in one minimum of the potential, but it could sort of also be in some other one. And that would be some instanton effect, which is something that people here have studied a lot. Yeah. But even if there's only one side of the series, this will be asymptotic. Yes. So there's some exact matrix in people. So you're saying the same in completion will work in all three boxes. All three series are asymptotic. Right. I honestly, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. Because we don't really know the non perturbative completion of the string theory size, but uh, presumably some of the things that Ashok is doing and so on. Uh, yeah. Sort of or what people have done in C equals one as well, sort of matching kind of single eigenvalue instantons to sort of D instantons yeah. on the bulk. I mean, if you have something one over, all orders one over, you can define the matrix model as a non perturbative. Yes, yeah, that's one way to do it, exactly. Ashok and others have been doing an autonomous calculation in the, in the string theory, I think, for the sequence to one and some other minimal strings, yeah. The Gu and others, they want their calculation. He's trying to match the matrix model non perturbative effect, but with an independent calculation. So Starting from string field theory, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, theory, so, so presumably you can do that. Yeah, we really haven't thought much about non perturbative effects yet. Okay, so what we want to do right now is to try to derive this equivalence. Okay, so before we get in the weeds of things, I want to try to articulate the logic a bit. Okay, because we're going to do something a little non standard. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to start at this top. Okay, this is some large end matrix model. So, again, we focus on the Gaussian, but this is true for interacting things. And instead of going directly to these closed strings, okay, these boxes over here, we're going to do something a little strange, which is to first find a different matrix model. So in the more string language, this is actually a different open string description, okay? And it turns out that this matrix model is actually something that was uh, studied uh, in the 90s and that we actually understand its relation to a particular type of closed string theory. That's yet another string theory that we haven't mentioned yet today, which is this box down here, okay? Which is the C equals one string at self dual radius. Okay, so this is a theory for those interested of Liouville coupled to a boson, a compact boson, and that the radius of compactification of the boson is exactly at the self dual radius. So uh, we're starting up here, we kind of work our way down. So again, to another open string description, the relationship between here and here actually followed via some integrability arguments. So you sort of showed what, that, what this matrix model was doing is that it served as a generating function of correlators in the C equals one string, okay? And you showed that this generating function satisfied a bunch of uh, sort of um, constraints, if you want. These are W infinity relations. So Spent has also worked on these things. Um, and you basically showed that sort of the generating function of these correlators and this part, this matrix integral satisfied those same sets of constraints. Okay, so that's the sense in which you have the relation here. And people then started wondering, okay, well, why is this C equals one string sort of so solvable? Okay, is there somehow a deep reason that maybe secretly it's some topological string? And it turned out to be true. So uh, I guess probably one of the first papers was by Muki and Bafa over here, which sort of teased out to this A model description of this C equals one string, okay? And they found exactly this Kazama Suzuki model. And then we're gonna uh, sort of, these authors over here, Goshal Bafa, and then again, sort of Goshal and Bimbo Muki, and then again, I guess separately, Hanani Oz and Plesser, they found sort of this B model description of this C equals one string at self dual radius, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna basically understand how traces via this box in the middle map onto operators here, and then we're going to piggyback off kind of this beautiful work by these authors to understand the duality between this box and this A model string and this B model string. Okay, so that will be the verification part of the talk. Okay, but then we want to sort of go back further and say, okay, can we somehow directly see why these are the string theories that had to appear? And that's when we're going to focus on these, these lines over here. So again, kind of the language we're going to be doing is starting by studying this matrix model using the tools of topological recursion and seeing how it's actually secretly in there some B model string, okay? And that will sort of complete that derivation. And over here, what we wanna do is we wanna really take seriously this, this toothed picture, use the Strabel parametrization, see that each Feynman diagram is mapping onto ver some very specific world sheets, okay? And then understand that this A model, so this closed string, the path integral here also only received contributions from very special string configurations, which are exactly the ones that are described by those Feynman diagrams, okay? So in that sense, we'll understand also why it is that this string theory had to pop out, okay? So for now, what we're gonna do is first kind of work our way down, kind of fan out. It's gonna be this verification part. And so this first step is going between two open string descriptions, which is something that we're not really used to thinking about. We used to just think, okay, there's n equals four, maybe there's not another open string description. So that's where this idea of open, closed, open triality um, really comes in, and that we really think of there as being multiple open string descriptions, okay? So let's do that, okay. 
Please. In this case, we also know that equal to one of these. The double scaling will not be select a certain scaling point. Yes. So this price will increase. Are you talking about the matrix quantum mechanics, the full matrix quantum mechanics? Yeah. Um, that, that's true. Yeah, I honestly don't really understand the sort of full reduction from the matrix quantum mechanics to the matrix model. So it's just the matrix integral. Um, um, yeah, I can't. Yeah. So, so, so there's something, yeah, I, I can't sort of tease out what it is physically that allows you to do that reduction. Um, yeah. So, what Spenta is alluding to is that in general, these matrices in the C equals one matrix model, um, they actually depend on time. So it's a matrix quantum mechanics. So it's a zero plus one dimensional path integral. Whereas here we're just looking at zero plus zero dimensional vanilla integrals like you do in high school. Um, and, but there's, there's somehow something very special about this string theory that it's able to be described just by a normal integral instead of a path integral. Um, but I don't have a good answer as to why. So is it, is it I think it's a little more involved than that. So it's not somehow just expanding in say modes on the thermal circle. And it, yeah, I, I, I think it's a little more, you don't have those modes, so yeah. It's just one matrix. So there's not a matrix for each Fourier mode, say on the thermal circle. Say like IKKT type so things. The matrix is not the momentum mode. So you have the momentum on the circle. Those are the trace n to the k. The k is the momentum on that circle, but it's discrete. Yeah. Okay. In any, in any way, I mean, this is going to really be a crutch for us. It's going to be a way that we're going to sort of work our way and to verify this proposal. Okay. Sort of ultimately, what we want to focus on is then kind of these two parts. Okay. So let's do this verification. I still do this, these two messy slides. If you want, you can ignore this whole bottom part of the slide. You can ignore all slides if you really want. <laughs> so this is our first encounter of this open, closed, open idea. And for now, all I want you to look at is just the single box, okay? That's all we need from this idea for now, okay? So let's look at what this box is. So this is an equality between two things. So the first between two matrix integrals, okay? So the first one is an integral over n by n matrices. It has some potential. It has some source y. And I've inserted q determinants in this integral, okay? This is equal. This is not some approximation. This is an exact equality. Um, to an integral over Q by Q matrices. So the same number as determinants over here. Okay, the same potential here. Now what used to appear in the determinants appears as a source and what used to appear in the source now appears in the determinants. And so if this was N by N, there are now N determinants over here. Okay. This little simple equality is gonna get a, a lot of mileage for us. We're gonna get a lot of mileage out of this equality. Now, let me just make a slight detour. So explaining a bit kind of the physics behind this equality for those for whom it's helpful, okay? So we think about these uh, matrix integrals as some sort of gauge theories, okay? These are some open string descriptions. So what are the open strings? Well, it's actually a, that this basic equality sort of arises from the fact that we're considering two systems of brains, okay? So there's an N and a Q, that's the N and the Q over here. And if you want, okay, for those for whom that's helpful, these are compact brains in some usually B model topological string. These would be some Q non-compact brains. And either of these matrix integrals, what they correspond to is sort of starting from the system and integrating out all the open, all the open strings. Okay, so for example, for this N by N model, I look at, I integrate out all the open strings between these guys and these guys, and all the open strings here just between the, these non-compact ones. And I look just at the sort of effective theory on the green stuff, okay? That would be what this first line is. But of course I can start from the system and I can integrate out whatever I want, right? So that's why these two things are gonna be equal. So I could start with the system and I can integrate out, if you want the green things over here and these blue strings over here, and I get some effective description just on these Q brains. And because I have these Q brains, that's why we have these Q by Q matrix integrals, okay? So sort of this equality is really a, a sort of just a statement that I'm starting with two systems of brains. And we'll see later that this actually has a, 
sort of a, there's a similar setup in full ADA, blown ADS-CFT that I can look at that has essentially these same features. Okay. So these are some of the manipulations that go into it. You don't really need to fully understand. Um, maybe the only thing that might be useful later in the talk is just to notice that I can write determinants by um, introducing some fermionic integral. And what that does is it gives me some sort of Yukawa coupling. So some psi dagger psi times this bosonic matrix M. That'll be the only thing that will be useful. No, no. So that can be a full matrix whose eigenvalues are the XAs. And this Y matrix has eigenvalues YI. You can take them to be diagonal. Okay. Yes, so you can take them to be diagonal. Yes. But not, the, but not multiples of identity, especially. Yeah. This is some exact equality. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, and, and physically, it just comes from the idea that these two things have to be equal because sort of my choice of what I integrate out is sort of up to me. Um, this is not even a target. Yeah, this is an exact N and, in, an N and Q statement. Okay, so. Is it changing your side? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I I think we're just now starting to understand a little, as of yesterday, uh, kind of uh, some of the physical meanings of this change in sign. Um, um, yeah, you're, you're you're worried about convergence of the integral, and yeah, so so there's there's probably some choices of contours and things like that, and I'm I'm sweeping under the rug here to make these things well defined. Um, yes, yes. Um, Right, right, right. Um, sorry, now this, this, is, this is an exponentially divergent integral. Yeah, well, well I, I think, yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. So when I write these integrals, there's always a bit of a choice of the contour that's implicit. And choosing that contour is also basically choosing a saddle point, say, in this matrix model. That should be possible, yeah. 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 That, that, that's, that's true, that's true. The, the, we also have a proof of this where you, you can actually compute this integral in terms of orthogonal polynomials. And you can do the same thing on the bottom and you can show that those two expressions are the same. So the second one you can do, the first one you can't actually have to define it. Yeah, so. Was there somehow a choice of, yeah, there, there must again been a choice of contour implicit when doing that computation, actually. I think that G parameter, G could be sort of imaginary and you can calculate yeah. the oscillatory integral of the 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 integral This is the most careful audience I've had uh, in all of these talks. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay. Good. So what I want to do now is I just want to start with this matrix equality, and we're just going to massage the top and bottom line and massage them into some forms that are already familiar to us. Okay, so let's do that. So for your convenience, I reproduced that, that equality. Okay, and uh, we're going to look at some specific com um, uh, uh, circumstance of this uh, equality where I set this y to zero. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, try it. So we're going to try to derive this generating function of correlators. Okay, so let's do that. So I'm going to take this top line and let's massage it uh, as follows. So I write debt as e to the trace log and I just Taylor expand that. Physicist's favorite thing to do. Okay, so that will just generate uh, some potential for this m with some particular coefficients that I call t bar k. Okay, so I'm going to now do the same thing on the bottom line. So note that this is a two matrix integral. Um, but I, I want to simplify it to a one matrix integral. And it turns out you can do that because these two matrices only couple the other product. So I'm just telling you that there's some change of variables you can do that allows you to split it into this. Again, the particular form isn't super important uh, right now uh, if you haven't seen these things before. If you have seen these things before, you would recognize this as what's known as this mbimbo muki matrix model. And this, the whole point of this matrix model was in order to write uh, to think of it as a generating function for uh, tachyon, so particular operators in the C equals one string theory. 
So how do these generating function works? Well, it means that I take some derivative uh, with respect to T bar K, and that sort of corresponds to inserting some operator on the string theory side. That's just what a generating function does, right? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, good. So because I have the equality of these two things, I can take this derivative with respect to T bar K on either side, okay? So we already said on the bottom side, the point of this matrix integral is that the derivative inserts some negative momentum tachyon. Now let's look at what happens if I take a derivative with respect to T bar K up here. All that's gonna do is just bring down some factor of trace M to the K. Okay. So all of this was true, no matter what other derivatives I was taking to all orders and N and Q. So what this is telling you is that just by thinking about on which integral I act this derivative, I can now translate as an operator dictionary between trace m to the k and these negative momentum tachyon in the C equals one string. That's where we get all this mileage, okay? It tells us how to translate between things on the matrix side and things in some closed string side, okay? So that was a little messy. Uh, let me just maybe point out that you might think that this is all a little crazy. So uh, you can do a very nice check, which is something that Rajesh did in what was it 1995, I think, uh, sitting on a balcony computing uh, to a couple orders in the one over n and sort of noticing that uh, the quantities, sort of these correlators in the Gaussian were equal to the one point functions of these tachyon operators in the C equals one string. And at the time it wasn't really understood uh, why that had to be true. Um, so they proved, they actually did the computation to all genus and showed that they were equal. There's some very nice notes still from, <laughs> I guess, 95. Um, but it, now we sort of have an understanding of why this had to be true as sort of an artifact of this open, closed, open triality. Okay. What is T, T, T2? What is T2 in this formula? Uh, what is T2? T2, T2. T2. Ah, good. So that's the, again, the statement that, um, so we can maybe go back over here. Um, sorry, uh, back. So, um, depending on what the potential is in this matrix model that I look at, I have some particular times turned on over here. I have some particular TKs, okay? So this mm. is just saying that a particular choice of matrix model potential, say the Gaussian, corresponds to turning on some background in the C equals one string. And in this case, that corresponds to turning on the momentum plus two, that's this T2 background. Mm. That that's... Mm -hmm. okay. okay, very good. So um, there's a lot of moving parts in this talk. So let me just maybe step back for one second and go back to what our ultimate goal was, which was to prove this proposal and just remind you what it is that we just did and how it actually proves the proposal because that punchline probably isn't totally clear. Okay, so what we just did was to explain how we go between these traces and these tachyon operators in this equals one string, okay? So now the point is that these gentlemen over here figured out not only just the equality of partition functions, they've really figured out a whole way to re-express all of these operators, both in this B model and this A model topological string. Okay, so now that means that from this equality, we now can translate directly between trace M to the K and sort of particular operators in the B model and trace M to the K and particular vertex operators in this A model side. Okay, so we're really piggybacking off a lot of this beautiful work here to just basically verify that proposal. So I think maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip this. And we all deserved some nice pictures now. So, um, okay. So we want to think back as a little, what were these manipulations kind of teaching us about holography? Um, and the, the, the claim is that there's probably something quite deep. Roughly the main thing to take away is that somehow uh, what open this simple equality of matrix integrals is sort of the instantiation of the following fact that there's sort of two ways to reconstruct the closed strings, okay, of, of holography, if you want, from gauge theory Feynman diagrams, okay? And it uses, so of course, I won't be able to explain all of the machinery that goes into this slide, but I'll just try to give you a little of a flavor of it. Um, if you want, starting from the closed string that we're trying to derive, there's a particular way of splicing up the string into various patches. And sort of it also is going to tell me how to glue all those patches together. If you want, that's kind of how we think about a manifold, right? Various patches glued together. So there's a particular differential on here called quadratic differential called the Strabel differential. And it has these properties so that when you see these infinities, so the poles of this differential lie at all the points where I would have some vertex operator inserted. Okay. 
And zeros are parts where if you want this, this kind of uh, dark, um, th these are sort of the edges of each patch, if you want, that I'm gluing together. And sort of where they meet are at these zeros. Now, what we've done is we sort of, what the Strigel differential does, why it's so powerful, okay, is it because it translates the complex structure of this, of this Riemann surface into sort of combinatorial data of a graph. That's why, in a way, it's so powerful for holography, if you want. And it's sort of tailor-made to translate between gauge theory Feynman diagrams and sort of 2D world sheets, okay? And if you want, there's sort of two ways that I could have gotten this graph. So one sort of simple way is just where the ribbons of the gauge theory Feynman diagrams just basically line up with this graph over here. This is what we call F-type duality, okay? There's basically a face, each face of the diagram corresponds to one vertex operator insertion. And essentially the way that you should sort of think about uh, the closed strings emerging is that all of these are sort of big holes in the world sheet. These are sort of d brain boundary conditions, okay? That's the loop, it's labeled by some index i, each face is labeled by an index. So that's the, which d brain the string is ending on. And these loops can just sort of, the, the d brain holes sort of shrink to zero size. And when they shrink, I can sort of replace it by a sum of local vertex operators. That's really the picture of how this type of duality works. Now, maybe the surprising thing is that there's a different way in which holography can work. And in fact, the, our standard example of n equals four doesn't fit in that picture of sort of D-brain boundary conditions shrinking, uh, sort of holes shrinking to zero size. So instead here, we call this V type, V for vertex, because here what we see is that the, vert the vertices of the Feynman diagram line up with where operators insertions would be. So this should sort of maybe ring a bell. If I'm computing some four point function in ADS CFT, I'm also computing a four point function on the world sheet, okay? So there should be as many vertices of the Feynman diagrams, external vertices here, as the vertices as sort of operator marked points on this Riemann surface. And if you want the ribbons, what they're doing, they sort of uh, conspire to kind of create a slightly different patch. And what you can see is that these lines are orthogonal to those lines, okay? So if you want, there's kind of a, a almost trivial way in which there could be two ways that this graph could be reconstructed. It's by looking at the dual graph, right? So now the really beautiful thing, uh, and this was first uh, shown by Rajesh in uh, 2011, and then seen again in the case of n equals four, and this has been now refined here by some work by uh, Rishab, and Demalia here um, for the two matrix case. Um, and it's just to, to, maybe you might just have to believe me here, that sort of the manipulations that went between one integral and the other, you can actually follow those manipulations through at the level of each single Feynman diagram, okay? And what you can show is that the edge, okay? So the edge for every matrix gets mapped into its dual edge, okay? So if you want what it's doing, it's exactly translating between the two ways, these two matrix integrals are the two ways in which their Feynman diagrams can reconstruct this world sheet. Okay, so it's, you know, um, the fact that we wanted to identify each Feynman diagram as a world sheet was a lot to ask for. And in particular required then that if these two theories really work this way, that also at the level of their Feynman diagrams, this graph duality had to hold. But you can show that indeed it does. Okay, so, um, okay, good. So maybe I'll skip a little here. Um, this is just maybe some details a bit as to how this uh, construction can work. Um, but the punchline that I want you to come away with today is not just that there are possibly two ways in which open closed string duality can work. Um, at least, I mean, we think that this should be a more general, broader thing about holography. But the idea is that there's really generically both types of ways that the string can be reconstructed and both of these open string descriptions exist. They coexist in fact, okay? So this is really extending the duality to a triality where you have open, open and closed. So that would be the, for example, these two matrix integrals and these closed strings are say these WCWs or this B model string, okay? <clears throat> and, and sort of this F and V type are sort of the two types of open closed duality that we just talked about. So now you can go back if you want to kind of your favorite holographic examples. And often we often only know about one, one description. Okay, so in N equals four, this would be this vertex type. For example, this lower one, uh, this is um, an example from, I guess the 
uh, Chern Simons on S3 and the A model on the deformed uh, resolved conifold. Okay. Um, so, for example, here it turned out that basically the faces, it was very much this D brain, this picture of D brain boundary condition shrinking to zero size. Whereas here, this is this V type that we talked about before. Okay. So, that's really the open, closed, open triality, this sort of very ambitious statement. Um, and of course, you know, the million dollar question is, for example, what is the F type description of this? So, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, so, so uh, it, it might well be that basically in one regime, one description is much better. Um, so uh, for example, it, it seems that kind of these V types are kind of tailor made for kind of the strongly coupled regime. Um, these F types are more sort of perturbatives around weak coupling. Um, so uh, I don't know, that's probably along the flavor yeah, of what you were asking at. So, so maybe which one is, is more helpful? So that's a natural expansion around the large radius limit, uh, uh, the, or the strong coupling limit at the end of this theory. And that's the natural way you get. So it's a different set of, I mean, it's a set of deep brains with borders on the flat space to which they are, they are on the boundary of the ADS. Uh, and uh, that's that open string description, I think is very useful in that uh, bit. I mean, it's the inputs for you, but it's sort of, Coming from that strong coupling picture, I think the other kind of brains, the F type brains, and maybe Edward will mention, mention it, but I, I don't know. But, uh, it, there, it's more natural to think of D brains around the zero radius ADS type. You can start with D brains in D radius, uh, but think of D brains at a small ADS pipe, a tensionless ADS pipe. And then those D brains back react if you put enough of them. And then they start blowing the geometry up from small radius to large radius. Uh, so that's another way in which you can, the D brains can back react and sort of create geometry. But you are starting from the other end. And that is the F type description. Uh, and in fact, maybe it was. No, no, please. But, no. Uh, I think it, and it's, uh, there are recent papers of Simon Carbo and others that seem to suggest that indeed there is an impact. Komatsu and others were also, uh, I speculated about it, but Komatsu tried to realize it very concretely um, uh, earlier uh, in the paper of his uh, and giant gravitons. So the giant gravitons in ADS5 and S5 are, in a sense, the dual brains. You can consider those are also D brains. But they are transverse D brains. Typically, they extend perpendicular in the radial direction. They, and it is the open string descriptions on those D brains which extend in the radial direction of the ADS5. Those can back react as well and then kind of expand the geometry. And that's the other kind of open string duality. And I think that's now growing kind of circumstantial uh, thing. And uh, this example that uh, what it's talking about is, of course, a simplification model. But then embedded in the ADS seems to also suggest that this work of Simon Carabo and so on, computing time graphs correlator, um, uh, uh, using a twister string theory, also seems to suggest that. So, there's a, so your question about what is the other open string description? It's probably a, like a time graviton uh, brain description, and. Uh, Probably in the language of the open twi string theory, open twister string theory of inputs for you. So inputs for you also has a description in terms of open twister string, which uh, is very useful for computing scattering amplitudes and perturbative angles and so on. So that so it will be useful from the perturbative point. And so the other one is probably more useful from some other points. Uh, yeah. So there is a sense, I think, in this what you say is correct. That this is a weak coupling, weak close coupling expansion. And not, not that this twister string description arised in the weak coupling description of Yang Mills. This is this early 2007 Witten paper. 
Um, so hopefully that gets your question sort of went what time um, either of these. Okay, so a lot of, lot of things uh, that we've seen, but just to recap, what we've done is we sort of told you about this duality. We told you about all the observables in this theory, how they agree to all orders in G string. We checked that that's true, okay? And now we want to pause for, let's say maybe the last 20 minutes and 15, uh, to try to tell you sort of why this had to be true, okay? So what we want to go back to is to try to understand why is it that those closed string theories had to appear? Okay, so we'll start again with this A model. And I don't know about you, but I knew nothing what the A model was uh, two years ago. So maybe one way to describe a string theory is just to think, so any string theory is some map from the world sheet to the target space, okay? And thinking about which maps I'm looking at is which string theory I'm looking at. So the A model is a theory of holomorphic maps, very particular maps from the world sheet to the target space. And we wanna look at the matrices and try to see where that information is hiding, okay? So three slides uh, to do that. Um, maybe the first thing I want to say is that, you know, you might have thought these comments about V versus F type, these are sort of very uh, speculative ideas. I want to take these prescriptions very seriously. Okay, so we're going to do our like little first baby toy Fisher Prize example of uh, a V type duality. And I want to use this Strabel construction and this V type uh, description and out of that really get some quantitative uh, prediction that I can then go check, okay? So, um, and the punchline is gonna be that we're gonna have an understanding about what is it that the correlation functions and just say the Gaussian matrix model, what they're actually doing. And what they're doing is they're counting particular points on the moduli space, okay? So this is some cartoon version of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G and then punctures. Remember that each point can be labeled um, by some Strabel graph with some, and the edges, the lengths uh, that I assign to the edges are coordinates. And so if you want, these are very special points with integer coordinates, okay? Say like five, three, one, two, six, four, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And what the correlation functions of the Gaussian theory is doing, it's just counting these points, given some restrictions. Okay? So that's gonna be the takeaway. So let's do this together, okay? So simplest thing I can think about is some three-point function. This here is a three-point function of trace m to the eight, trace m to the eight, trace m to the eight, and that's because there are eight legs that come out of each vertex, okay? These double dots, this is just some technical simplification. It means no self-contractions. That's why you don't see anything that goes from one vertex to the same one. So there's only one such graph here, it turns out. That's gonna make our life a little easy. So what I wanna do is I wanna start from this Feynman diagram and I wanna get that closed string picture, okay? So if I start with an open string, there are holes on the world sheet. Where are the holes? Well, it's all the things between the ribbons, okay? So what we wanna do is we wanna close the holes in order to get the closed string theory. Okay, so let's do that in succession. So where are the holes? Okay, it's any face that I have. So this is labeled here. You see some face, there's some free index in there. So all of them where I glue any two ribbons together that share that same hole, okay? So I'm gonna, first of all, glue all the ones of the same color if you want, okay? And what that's going to map onto is actually creating some semi-infinite strip, okay? So the vertices are going to be the closed string insertions, just as we said that, you know, a three-point function in ADS-CFT has to be a three-point function on the string theory side. So I close up the holes, and so I first create, so all the blue guys create this blue strip over here, the red guys create this red strip over here, the green guys create this green strip over here. So there's two holes we haven't closed, which are these two leftover indices I, okay? So there's one face here, and then there's this leftover one, this J index flowing in the back, okay? So where are those here? There's basically this I index in the front. Can you kind of see that? I don't know. And there's like a J index if you want in the back, okay? And so closing up those last holes corresponds to sort of gluing all those sheets together again along the common index, okay? So now I get this sort of pair of pants diagram that we learn in, in our sort of first string theory course, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the dual graph to that. That's what's gonna to correspond to the Strabel graph. So that's this yellow thing over here. Okay, so why are there these numbers four, four, and four? It's the fact that there were four width contractions. Okay, it's the width of the strip. So the width of these strips over here were the number of width contractions. So of course I can only have integer amounts of width contractions. So I will always have strips that are sort of integer length if you want. So all of these numbers that I assign to each edge are always gonna be integers, okay? So that means that the points on moduli, okay, 
And now you have to remember that there's this Strable tool that allows me to translate between a graph with edge length assignments and a point on moduli space. Okay, so what we just saw is that, okay, hopefully now kind of the generic, you can imagine doing this for some big correlator, you sum over all the Feynman diagrams, and in each Feynman diagram, you sort of do the same thing. You'll end up with some yellow graph with some numbers assigned, and all those numbers are gonna be integers because they're just the number of wick contractions, okay? So we can translate this as a sum over integer length Strable graphs, and each Strable graph corresponds to one point on the moduli place. That's the beauty about this whole Strable construction, okay? So the sum over these graphs is just the sum over those points. It's just counting those points, okay? So this tells us very concretely that you can just interpret this correlator as a lattice point count, okay? Now this turns out to be something mathematicians study. It goes under the name of discrete volumes of moduli space, okay? And you can take your sort of favorite book on, uh, paper on the subject, often they have some tables in the appendix, okay? And you can now just check, do the correlation functions in the Gaussian matrix model agree with those numbers? And indeed they do, okay? This is just a sanity check if you want, that sort of everything I'm telling you is true, okay? Good, so right now we talked about which are the world sheets, right? So each point on the moduli space is a particular world sheet configuration. I didn't tell you yet about the maps from the world sheet to the target. So that's what we're gonna do in this next slide. And we're just gonna use a very nice trick, okay? It, it, why this is true, just trust me for now, okay? Uh, you don't really need to understand the details, but I'm just telling you that sort of, you can re-encode the combinatorics of all the various weak contractions as some sum over particular permutations. And, there are, and these permutations, they're labeled by three different permutations. And if you want, when you're out there drawing your Feynman diagrams, okay, what they correspond to is, um, the edges of the Feynman diagrams, okay, these are the wick contractions in your Feynman diagram. The second permutation correspond to the vertices, okay, so this is, this is some cycle notation for permutations. If you haven't seen that, don't worry too much about it. But what I'm doing is I'm just taking the Feynman diagrams and re-expressing those graphical datas in terms of three permutations, okay? Now, if you're a mathematician, you can translate, you uh, sort of, there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between permutations and branched coverings of the sphere, okay? And the branching above, okay, so what does that mean? That means you take some world sheet and you wrap the sphere and sometimes you wrap it around multiple times, okay? So the world sheet can self-intersect. This is some cartoon of the sphere, the Riemann sphere, okay? Zero and infinity are the two hemispheres, if you want, the two poles. Um, and this is like the world sheet on top of it, wrapping it, okay? And it's kind of self-intersects. And these permutations, what they're doing is they're telling you exactly sort of how the world sheet self-intersects. It tells you about the branching. Now, it turns out I can't take any string and sort of wrap it in exactly this way around a sphere. Only very particular world sheets allow you to do that, okay? What a, so this is a famous theorem by Belly, okay? That the only sort of world sheets that allow to sort of holomorphically cover the sphere that way are exactly the ones labeled by these integer points, okay, that we just saw in the previous slide. So counting these points is the same as counting these maps from the world sheet to this target space sphere that satisfies these conditions, okay? And we've directly gone from the matrices and sort of re-expressed the combinatorics of wick contractions in terms of some data about maps. Okay. So that's where these holomorphic maps are hiding in the matrix. Okay, so I told you I would take some limit and I would recover some of the old things we already knew about matrix models in the double scaling limit, okay? So as I was telling you in this pre-seminar, okay, uh, this is the eigenvalue distribution of some matrix theory. Take the Gaussian as just some, uh, some circle, okay? So it means take some big matrix, take its eigenvalues, bin it, make a histogram, it'll look like that. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at this correlation function, and I'm gonna look in the limit where the K is very large, trace of many, many matrices at once, like the BMN limit in ADS-CFT, okay? Now, what is that gonna do? Remember the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues of the matrix, right? So trace M to the 2K is just the sum of the eigenvalues to the 2K. So what dominates that sum? It's the largest eigenvalue, okay? 
So when I take this limit, what I'm looking at is I'm actually sort of zooming in onto the largest eigenvalues here, okay, in, in absolute value. So I'm zooming in onto the edges of the distribution. Now, for those sort of who work on matrix models and double scaling, you'll sort of recognize that that's exactly what you end up doing in the double scaling limit. So this is sort of a nice language, if you want, a nice limit of your results to connect with what you already knew from the double scaled. And so we already said, okay, these correlators, what they do is they count a bunch of these points, okay? And so as I take trace M to the K, if you want, I can have many possible contractions between all the vertices, right? Because each vertex has lots and lots of legs. And so if you want, I keep adding points onto there, more and more points on this point. And in this K goes to infinity limit, what you want is I've sort of covered this so densely that the counting these points is the same as computing some volume of this space. And if you want, these are what are called the Konzevich volumes. This is some particular volume form on moduli space. Details aren't too, too important. But sort of the new perspective here of the double scaling limit is that the sort of um, discrete surfaces were really actually just these particular points on the moduli space. And the double scaling limit, what it's doing is it's just sort of allowing you to explore more and more possible string configurations. And sort of having every possible string configuration means instead of counting these points, I'm just sort of integrating. I'm just looking at the area over here, okay? Good. So these are some words, they're a little vague, take them or leave them. Um, but you know, maybe some of the things you might wanna have in mind is that uh, you might think of this sort of as the kind of full emergent geometry, if you want. And sort of this BMN limit in, in ADS-CFT, what it does is you sort of wash away the full ADS and you just have this kind of flat space PP wave geometry, okay? And if you want sort of that seeing just very a small part of the geometry, just sort of the edge of the distribution. Those are just words. These are the sort of more um, concrete things. But in a way, if you want stepping away from the double scaling limit is sort of stepping away and sort of seeing the full ADS if you want. Um, you the curve, yes, from that point of view also, that's true. Like that's, that's a good point, yeah. So, so what we're just, is just pointing out is that uh, the spectral curve of the matrix model versus the double scale matrix model is also different. And it also corresponds to zooming in on a very particular part of the spectral curve if you want. And uh, if you think of the spectral curve as sort of defining the geometry that we were talking about, then again, it's sort of the, the this BMN limit just sort of zooms in onto one part. Okay, good. So I, I don't know how, how much time um, maybe I have three more slides on this B model. Uh, you can, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So we'll, we'll keep it short on this B model. Um, so, you know, we talked about the A model. What was the A model? Those were holomorphic maps. Now what we wanna see is we wanna see constant maps. We wanna see sort of where the whole world sheet just gets shrunk to a point, okay? Um, but they satisfy some condition. So the string, what it wants to do, it wants to also minimize the potential, okay? So if you want, there are constant maps from the world sheet into these critical points of this potential like a ball rolling down a hill, okay? So uh, I won't describe everything on this slide, don't worry. Um, but the logic here, if you want, is we're gonna start with this matrix integral, okay? And uh, via these loop equations, we derive this spectral curve. And then if you want, there's sort of this giant machinery of topological recursion. It spits out a bunch of functions, certain differentials, labeled by two things, which are gonna to correspond to the genus of the surface and the number of insertion points. And if you want, there's sort of two ways of understanding what those differentials mean, sort of the output of this topological recursion. On one hand, they correspond to just traces of one over X minus M on the matrix model side. But it turns out that um, you can also rewrite them as integrals over moduli space. Okay, that's maybe a harder thing to imagine. And if you want sort of the dictionary that's allowing you to translate between the sort of random matrix theory side and sort of, into, sort of sums over 2D surfaces is sort of the quality here of these two descriptions, the fact that they're sort of packaged in the same data, okay, sort of. Now, one thing I did promise you was to tell you, depending on which matrix model, I had to tell you what B model. So I had to tell you what was the potential. And I'm just telling you that sort of the prescription, if you want, is to solve the spectral curve for X in terms of Y. And that gives you the functional form of this super potential, okay? So, in this Gaussian, this is the spectral curve, and that's the super potential corresponding into the Gaussian matrix model. Okay. Please. 
So I mean, the spectral curve, if it looks unfamiliar, it's just a complexification of the Wigner semicircle because you can see it's just a quadratic which is relating X and Y. So it's really the Wigner semicircle that's written in a different way. That's right. Yeah, so this is the moduli, same moduli space we've been talking about. So the moduli space of Riemann surface whoa, of genus G and N punctures. Yeah. And if you want, sort of, if you've ever practiced topological recursion, you know, sort of, that everything comes down to very special points labeled by, uh, these are called the branch points. That's where dx vanishes. And if you want something that's the, the special points on the string theory side are the critical points of the potential I was telling you. And if you relate W and X, sort of the critical points of the potential sort of map onto the branch points of the spectral curve. So you can sort of work this way through and you can translate between quantities on the topological recursion side and quantities on this um, B model side. Just endpoints of the yeah. Of yeah. The yeah. So on this slide, I'll just maybe give you a bit of a flavor of how concrete we can make these things. Okay. So Again, as always, these are the type of things that you want to uh, compute. And I'm telling you that you can recast this type of integral as some integral over moduli space. The one over n expansion is again the genus expansion of some particular operators in a CFT. So that's like the matter part, okay? Like in bosonic string theory, these would be the 26 bosons, okay? Um, and this, is, this basically tells you about the coupling to 2D gravity on the world sheet, okay? And there's a sort of very explicit operator dictionary sort of between trace m to the k and sort of primary operators on this, on this sort of CFT, if you want, and particular vertex operators that you should think of maybe as coming from the ghosts, okay, something like that. Um, but this is extremely explicit, so you can just really, you know, anytime you see a trace, you plug this in on moduli space, you compute this integral, and you can just match these numbers, okay, so this is just a uh, something very, very concrete and explicit you can do. Okay, so last thing I just told you, we'll uh, kind of recover a lot of the things by taking this BMN limit. So um, let me just say that, uh, for example, the limit of traces um, sort of in this BMN limit, there was a sort of very beautiful result that those corresponded to some very particular integrals over moduli space. Um, this was some really uh, impressive work by Okunkov and Okunkov and Pandari Pandey. This partly is what won him the Fields Medal. Um, and, you know, this was a very hard proof. Um, and sort of now kind of from our work, this is something that follows in a couple lines. So that's actually a very nice thing, you know. It's one of those rare times in life where the factors of pi's and two to the g, everything just line up, you know. This never work on the first time, but this just, it all worked on the first time. So that was very nice. Um, and roughly, if you want, sort of what goes into that is the fact that you can take this operator dictionary and just take the limit directly. So that's why it's sort of a simple thing. And kind of physically what's going on is that the sort of matter part of the theory kind of decouples from the gravity on the world sheet. And that ends up basically reproducing this nice result. Okay, so I think I'll end on this uh, final slide here, which is just to tell you, okay, we've done all of these for these matrix models. What does this tell you about ads -CFT and sort of kind of what's the path forward? Um, so you might think that this beast of n equals four is sort of very, very far from this uh, Gaussian matrix model, but I just want to argue that actually there's some stepping stones in between that kind of line out a path for what you might want to do. And in fact, actually, there are the, it turns out that the Gaussian matrix model actually computes some subset of observables in n equals four super Yang mills. Okay, so there's kind of this embedding if you want. So you can find some simplified subsector of n equals four called the chiral subalgebra. Okay, so that's this box over here. And it turns out that even within this subsector, there's a sort of further topological subsector. It's topological because it's a zero plus zero dimensional integral, right? Um, and that's captured by this Gaussian matrix model. Okay, so what we've done today in this talk is to sort of go between the Gaussian matrix model and the sort of dual bulk closed string theory. Over here, this is kind of ultimately what you'd want to be able to prove, okay? And if you want, there should also be a kind of embedding of the closed string theory side. So this needs to fit into that, needs to fit into that. And if you want, actually, this subsector, this has been a whole program called the Twisted Holography Program. So this is of Gaiotto, Costello, a student uh, Budzik, and Natalie Paquette over here. So where they've thought of the, the dual just to this closed subsector, 
and it's also some topological string. Um, so one of the things maybe missing in this box is kind of the A model version of that. Um, but if you want, so there, there is some stepping stone that should allow us to kind of, if we can derive this over here, try to understand a little better how that fits into this derivation. And then, well, this is the ultimate goal. What is this, but, this is like the sort of uh, Rastelli beam story. So where you, where you do this twist. Yeah, you're asking about this. So these are all these, uh, uh, so there's a, yeah. You can localize the set of the full 40 uh, observables to, these are just gonna be uh, 2D observables. This is some holomorphic subsector. So write the, yeah, I don't know. You consider plane in any, you consider correlators of- Planar on, on angles four. Two-dimensional plane. Uh, and uh, uh, the operators themselves are chosen such that their R symmetry is aligned to their position. So it's sort of like a twisted, I mean, so they have the SO, SU4 R symmetry, and then there is a, uh, the, uh, the orientation of the plane inside the R4 uh, of the N equals to 4. Uh, you have to choose them in such a way. So then if you consider correlators of these operators, O1, O2, O3, they depend on some ZZ bar, Z1, Z1 bar, Z2, Z2 bar on that plane. But it turns out, if you choose this twisted algebra, they depend only holomorphically, like a two-dimensional vertex algebra. Like, uh, and uh, so it's a simplified, so the correlators are just given by like a two-dimensional vertex algebra, like of currents in a particular set of objects. This particular, it's a kind of a BTS set that preserves sort of a certain. And if you want, sort of the field theory description is some gauged beta gamma system. Yeah. So, so there's a, it's it is 2D. It's only yeah. the current part of the 2D set. In general, the 2D set even have matter primaries. Yeah. And then the current part is this is the current spot, like the Virasoro or the Cartesian currents and so on. Their algebra is purely homomorphic. Um, okay, I don't have a good, uh, I don't have a good physical motivation. I can just tell you that there's, yeah, the, so, uh, it, yeah, you, you, you take some particular combination of operators here and they're labeled by two variables, okay? And it turns out that when the, both of these variables are sort of set equal, if you want, there's some kind of diagonal subsector, if you want that the correlation functions of those operators don't actually depend on the value of that variable. They don't depend on the position of where those operators were inserted. And the, in the sense that- another structure. When you have that string- I see, I see. This thing, it preserves additional supersymmetry, and then the correlators are completely independent of position. Just given back. And it's the same thing. This is some like half PPS, right? Localization of the 
half PPS that's in loop of n equals to four n. That's it's the same kind of supersymmetric. As Quinn famously kind of argued that uh, 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 half PPS was in loop in n equals to four n. It's some by a Gaussian matrix model and expression by the matrix model. And it's the same supercharges, the same kind of thing. So it's It's a, it's a nice chain of embeddings. Oh, well, th this we'd like to understand a little better. Um, so I think this is some things that are in discussion yeah. currently. Um, and, and you know, you mean how it is embedded? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's some discussions before that. I, I think it should be possible. It's sort of, I guess, maybe you. I mean, it's like the cigar uh, that, that geometry as a do like the word said, it's a cigar. This, what is the cigar? The cigar can be thought of as sitting inside ADS three times S three, where uh, where the cigar radial direction is the radial direction of ADS three, and then there's a circle which is the circle sitting inside uh, inside the S three. So you have ADS five times S five. Inside that is ADS three times S three is the circle. Inside that is the cigar. So at least at the level of the geometric embedding, that's sort of the way the geometry is understood. The first embedding is well understood. That's the first embedding I will go there and uh, look at that embedding of the ADS S three S L to see where it is, is uh, how it's embedded. Second part, yeah, of course, I said it's a little bit cheesy because the cigar is really the A model geometry, but it's yeah. sort of like the same sphere in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think morally different. We don't understand yeah, that. there's some things to be done on that embedding. That needs to be uh, fleshed out, but I think uh, Guy also had actually a kind of a sketch of how it would go. And, yeah. Uh, it sounded a bit cheesy. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave here and then. If there are more questions, thank you very much. Right, thanks, Edward, for the talk. Are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. Like uh, when uh, you had that, when you were integrating out, when you were integrating in the fermions, you had uh, a V of uh, psi psi dagger, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, you want to go back? We can go back to that side if that's helpful. Yeah. The next one, yeah, yeah. So, in the last line, you have v of minus g psi psi dagger, right? Yep. Now, if you uh, if, if the v was just m square, you would have a quartic term in the psi psi daggers, is that isn't that correct? That's right, yeah. So, uh, I was just wondering, I mean, if you now on that term, if you use the Hubbard Stratton transformation and uh, reduce it to a uh, psi psi dagger coupled to a phi. And then you integrate out the size. What happens? What 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 is the theory for the phi that you get? Then you get essentially the second line here uh, for the Gaussian case. So you can take a to be Gaussian, and then you can integrate out a. So that that's in fact actually the original derivation. So the the this is a sort of all potential generalization for the particular Gaussian. So if v is Gaussian, I can always integrate out the first matrix, and then I get an effective one matrix theory. And in that Gaussian one matrix theory. This derivation was done via Hubbard Stratanovich, exactly as you were saying, by Maldacena, Moore, Cyborg, and Chi. So that Hubbard Stratanovich field is, is exactly these sort of uh, bosonic matrices, if you want. Um, and the, the, maybe the statement is that if you want the, the, the equations of motion of the Gaussian tell you it, it, it are sort of the same equations as what these delta functions impose. So this would be the saddle point of your Hubbard Stratanovich. Whereas here, they're sort of in a way, they're kind of exact collective fields in the sense that you have some delta function. Collective in the sense that it's built out of a bunch of fermions giving you these k's. Does that answer your oh, question? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, this 
Yep. Uh, A model and a B Um, well, I guess via the equivalence to the sequels one string, I would say they, that was true. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, and again, sort of the, the symmetry that's relating these, you should probably think of as this, this mirror symmetry that you have in topological strings. Yeah. If there are no more questions, let's thank Edward once. Okay, thanks again.